Good evening. So we are going to be in John chapter 8 tonight for our main text. If you want to go ahead and start turning there, we'll get there in just a few moments. John chapter 8. And so tonight we're going to be talking about freedom. It's it's fairly timely, right, with, with the 4th of July being tomorrow. You know, and it's a time when, when we as Americans should stop and think about the, the freedoms that we enjoy. You know, the, the freedoms that we have to, uh, uh, to, to assemble, like here tonight. The freedoms we have to, to uh, be able to believe in, in God if we choose to. The freedom to be able to um, speak our mind on issues. The freedoms to be able to carry a Bible with us wherever we go. The freedoms to be able to, to, to pray in Jesus' name. And so we should all give thanks to God for, for these rights that we enjoy as Americans. But did you know that, that even as Americans, it's possible for us to still not be free, to not truly be free? People, who, people can enjoy the same rights, the same liberties as, as, as guaranteed to the citizens of this nation, but can still not be truly free. They can be free, you know, in society, but they can still be in slavery and still be in bondage spiritually. And as Americans, some might say that we're born with, with, with a potential, but perhaps a great potential that we might find freedom both spiritually as well as um, society, in, the, in society. But the choices that we make every day influence that potential. I think Samson knew something about this. Uh, we're gonna, gonna use him a little bit as an illustration tonight. So it's gonna talk kind of a high level about Samson just to bring it back to your memory if you haven't read the story in a while. And so Samson began his life with, with great expectation, with great potential. It was, it was foretold that he would be a deliverer of Israel. And according to scriptures, he was to be a Nazarite from birth. Even his, his mother, while she carried him, uh, became a Nazarite. If you aren't familiar with Nazarite vows, um, it means pretty much that they, they took three uh, sets of vows, and, and they did this to, to set themselves apart unto God. As, as a sign of these vows, uh, of this vow to the Lord, they would uh, never cut their hair, they weren't supposed to touch dead, dead bodies, and they weren't supposed to drink wine. And you might think, well, what, are, what, what do these things have to do with being set apart to God? Well, they, they are symbolic in nature. You know, never cutting their hair. And if you took someone who was a Nazarite who wasn't a Nazarite, you stuck them next to each other, you'd be able to tell the difference. They would stand out in their appearance. They, their appearance would set them apart unto God. Never touching a dead body would give them appearance that they are somehow uniquely alive. And the prohibition against strong drink meant that, that, they, that they would not seek any stimulus in their lives other than God. And so people took a Nazarite vow because they, uh, the, the average person, because they didn't want to be average. They wanted to be um, exceptional. They want to be exceptional Israelites. They wanted to have an exceptional, be exceptional spiritually, if you will. And Samson uh, was, was a Nazarite from birth. And so he followed these vows. And, uh, but Samson wasn't, he wasn't like other Nazarites. He was a little bit different, right? He had uh, some, also some extra uh, physical abilities. He had exceptional strength. And from the outside looking in, it might have appeared that Samson could do anything. And, tr and truly, whenever the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, nothing could stand in his way. But, if you, but if, you, if you know the story, you know that when Samson grew up, when he became an adult, instead of delivering his people, sadly, his life falls apart. It starts out as he begins to, to uh, pursue a, Philist, a Philistine wife despite his parents' objections. He just continues a downward spiral as he starts to hang out with, uh, with friends that are a bad influence on him. And he continues to use his power, but not, not to deliver his people, but instead for selfish reasons, for wasteful reasons. And one at a time, he begins to break his Nazarite vows. It starts out that, that he touches a dead body, a dead carcass. But shortly after that, he finds out that he still has his powers. A little bit later, he, he drinks some wine, and, but he finds out that he still has his powers. But then he begins a relationship with Delilah. 
And eventually, she's able to get out of him that, that the secret to his strength is in his hair. And this time, when this last vow is broken, something different happens. His power is gone. And the saddest part of it all is that he doesn't even recognize that the power has left him. In Judges 16 and 20, it uh, says that, then she, Delilah, says to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he woke up from his sleep and thought, I will go out as before and, sh uh, and, sh and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. He had become so desensitized to, to his, his spiritual situation that he didn't even know that the Lord had left him. And his great potential would go unfulfilled. And if you know the story, you know it doesn't stop there. It continues on. It gets, gets even sadder because in, in verse 21, it says that the Philistines, they, they seize him, they gouge out his eyes, they take him down to Gaza, they, they put him in shackles, and they set him to grinding grain in the prison. And so the man that was to, to free all of Israel is now in, in, in an oppression by the Philistines. He is now blind. He is now a captive slave. He is now grinding grain in a prison. His life has literally caved in around him. It's a tragic story, right? He was to liberate his people, but now he has fallen into servitude and slavery. But this isn't just a, a story of Samson, right? It's a story of, of countless people that have lived between then and now. People who, who, it could be a mirror to their lives, that people that had great potential but have somehow fallen short and found themselves potentially even in bondage. And surely we all know someone like that. Samson was meant to be a deliverer, but instead he had become a slave. And so tonight, we're going to take a look at John chapter 8, and verses 31 to 36. And our goal tonight is to discover what lies behind slavery and, and uh, what is the prescription to break free of slavery. What should our motivation be? How should, can we get on that path of freedom? And so in this, this passage tonight, we're going to pick up in the middle of a dialogue between Jesus and some religious leaders. So Jesus has already proclaimed that he is the light of the world and implied that, that, that his opponents, these religious leaders, that they're in darkness. He's already warned the Jews that they're in danger of the fire of hell because they're from below and he is from above. And while they're still licking their wounds from this, Jesus uh, continues the argument even further, suggesting that they might actually be in bondage. Let's take a look. John chapter 8, verses 31 to 36. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave does not, now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but the son belongs to it forever. So who the son sets free is free indeed. So in these verses, the, the, um, these religious leaders that Jesus was, were talk, was talking to, they thought that they were free. They thought because they were a descendants of Abraham's that they enjoyed freedom. But they completely missed Jesus' point because Jesus wasn't talking about a physical slavery. Jesus was talking on a spiritual level. And we can see that by their answer in verse 33 where it says, we are descendants of Abraham. Uh, we have never been slaves. How can you say you will set us free? And in other words, they, they were saying, you know, we're not in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will set us free from, from, from bondage? And not only did they misunderstand what Jesus was saying, but they were also deceiving themselves because they were in physical bondage. I mean, if you look at the nation of Israel, they were time and time again enslaved from, from the time of Abraham till the, uh, the time of Jesus, you know, by Egypt, by Babylon, by the Philistines, by the Greeks, and now they're, they're under oppression by the Romans. And so the, 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 the Jews were slaves. They just didn't want to admit it. They wouldn't admit that they had a problem. 
But our Lord, he, he's speaking about a spiritual slavery. And, though, and those that even recognize that that, what, that is what he was talking about, a spiritual slavery, even they chose to deny their condition. In verse 34, uh, Jesus replies, Very tr- truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And so, you know, not much has changed over the last 2,000 years. It, people today are still confused about their spiritual slavery, about their spiritual bondage. People today still won't accept the truth of their conditions. And if someone suggests to them that, that they are in bondage, they often resist the idea. And the more enslaved they are, often the more th- that they resent the truth. I kind of like how John Calvin puts it. It's an old English, but I think it still make, uh, makes sense today. He says that the greatest mass of, the, the greater the mass of vices is one buried under, the more fiercely and bombastically does he extol free will. And we've probably all seen examples of this. I mean, whether you've seen it in, in real life or you've seen it portrayed on TV, but it's, it's, it's the, the picture of someone who is, who is so stuck in like an addiction, like maybe they're, they're an alcoholic and that they don't realize that they have a problem. And so their family does what? They have an intervention, an intervention in hopes that they would be able to wake the person up, to wake the person up, to, to show them that, they, that they're in bondage, that they're enslaved. But like the Jewish people, these people are often desensitized to their true conditions. It's the idea that if you take a frog and you put it in a pot of water and you put it on the the stove and you you turn on the heat, that the water temperature will rise so gradually that the frog will not realize that the water is actually getting warmer. And it's not until it's too late and the water is boiling that it will realize that, that the water has gotten too hot for him. And it's the same thing happened to Samson. At first, he dipped his toe in the, in the pot of water, he, and he touched a, a dead carcass, but he didn't get burned. So he's like, maybe I can sit on the edge of the pot and dangle my feet in. So he sits on the edge of the pot, starts drinking uh, um, some wine, and still doesn't get burned. So he's like, why not jump in and swim around? And, and, and uh, he doesn't notice that the temperature of the water is rising. And when he finally realizes the water is boiling, he's gone too far and the spirit of God has left him. And he finds out the hard way that, that his powers were not unconditional, that his powers could be taken away. And amazingly, after, after three attempts by Delilah to, uh, on his life, Samson tells her the secret of this power. And his sin robs him of his sensibilities. And he might have even thought, I've broken the other two and had no consequences. What's wrong with breaking the third vow? Samson likely thought that he was the the freest man, and yet he was the greatest slave. And the same thing can happen to us today. We can think that we're the freest people uh, on the face of the earth or on the verge of achieving great freedom in our lives. But if we begin to depart from God's word, if we begin to dip our toe in the water, you know, we might not get burned right away. But the the further we get away from the word of God, the uh, the harder, the more desensitized we can get and the harder it'll be to come back. And before we'll know it, we can find ourselves in the greatest bondage that we've ever known. And in such a state, it's easy for us to resent um, the suggestions of our family, the, res- the suggestions of, of our friends who are just trying to wake us up and help us to realize that, that obeying the word of God is the only way to break the bonds uh, on our lives. And when you're in that spot, it, you know, we as humans, we, we excel at minimizing things. It's easy for us to say, it's not that bad. I just need to make a few course corrections. I'll get back on track. Don't worry about me. I can stop any time I want. Come on, it's not that bad. It's not like I killed anybody or anything like that. Just a small little white lie, right? But when we begin to downplay the severity of our sins, bondage has already begun to set itself into our soul. And if we don't turn around, if we don't return to the Lord, the the devil is liable to lull us to sleep 
and we'll sit in the pot of water and not realize the water temperature is rising until it's too late. So you might, if you find yourself in that place, in, in a place where, where you've realized that you're in the pot of water or you realize that, that you don't ever want to get there, you might ask the question, well, how do I find this path to freedom? How do I get to freedom? How do I, how do I make it there? How do I stay there? And the good news is, is that Jesus doesn't leave us hanging. He gives us the solution. And he gives it to us in, in verses 31 and 32 when he says uh, to, the, to the Jews who had, who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So verse 31 says, to the, uh, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. So if you hold to my teachings, that word hold there, it kind of has a dual implication, right? It's first you have to, to get there, and then once you get there, it's, it's about staying there. It, the, the, the Greek word there can literally be translated, continue to live. So it's, it's, if Jesus is saying, if you continue to live in my teachings, and so it involves two things. It, it, was, it talks about, uh, um, it talks about um, holding to Jesus' teachings. So it's about learning Jesus' teachings. It's about learning the Bible. But it's not about just gaining head knowledge, right? Because it's, it, it takes more than head knowledge. It's about obeying it. It's about applying it to our lives, And if you read the word of God and you apply it to your lives and you truly obey it, then Jesus says that we will be set free. And so if you find yourself in that pot of water and you realize that, that, that you need to find the path to freedom, Jesus says the, the process is simple. You just have to, to, to learn his word and obey his word. And in, in verse 31, it says, when you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. That word disciples there, it can literally be translated as, as, as a learner. So you were, he says, as if Jesus is saying, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my learners. That is, if you put yourself, if, if, you, if, you, if you hold to his teachings, if you, if you learn his teachings, if you apply them to your life, then you will be in a progressive state of, of being set free, a progressive liberating state. And if you become a learner of the truth, if you become a learner of God's word or the Bible, then, then you'll find more possibilities of truth. And the more possibilities of truth that you learn, the more that you will be able to obey them. And the more that you obey him, the more, more um, open you are to, to the freedom that God wants to give you. And in verse 32, uh, it says, that then you will know the truth. And by becoming a learner and by holding to Jesus' teachings, we, we, uh, we open ourselves up to truth. Not scientific truth, not historical truth, but spiritual truth. We learn about the, the nature of man. We learn about the nature of God. We learn about the, the path to salvation. We learn about how to get on the path to freedom. And, it become, and we become confident in these things as we hold to them, as we, as we learn them and apply them to our lives, as, as, as we, we hold to them. And with this, comes, with this truth comes freedom. And so as one grows in the knowledge of truth, the more freedom is possible. And the more that we hold to it, and the more that we continue to, to learn it of his, of his word, the, the, the greater the learner we become, the more open we are to his truth. And the more truth that we learn, the, the, the more truth that we apply to our lives, the freer we can become. And it becomes cyclical. It becomes a, a pattern of, 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 that repeats itself over and over again. And Jesus says that the key to all of it is holding to his words, to continually living in his words. And living in his words uh, begins with being a student of God's words. And if you compare, you know, this present church age to the ch several of the church ages in the past, it would be easy to see that, that this, this generation, that, that this, this culture of ours is, is one that tends to be biblically ignorant. And so these people, they, they fail to take this, this first step of, of learning God's word. And yet it is just as important today as it's ever been throughout, throughout all the church ages. 
You know, in Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And it still applies today. In Colossians 3 and 16, it says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, with the psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And it's still true and necessary today. And in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, it says, do not... do." Do your best to present yourself as one approved, a worker that, who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. It's still as important today as it's ever been. And so we all need to, to know God's word. It's not just for the preachers. It's not just for the children's workers or the youth workers. It's for all of us, anyone who calls himself a believer, a Christian, and yet, even if, if we take this step, even if we take the step of, of learning God's word, I think that our culture is also pretty bad about obeying it. And yet, how does freedom come? It comes from not just learning God's word, but obeying it and applying it to our lives. And then Jesus says that we can be set free. And the, the, as we get freer, the, the more exhilarating it is in our lives, the more motivated we are to study God's word, and then the more that we obey God's word, and then the more freedom that we can find. And then the goes, cycle goes on and on and on, and we get freer and freer and freer, and we go from freedom to freedom to freedom. And I think the, that the reason that, that many Christians today often experience a lack of spiritual freedom in their lives is that they, they first often lack to, 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 to the study of God's word, that they are biblically illiterate, that they don't obey that the simple truth of, of holding to God's word and learning his word, but not just learning it, but applying it to their lives. And so perhaps if you look at your life and you say, you know, I'm not as, as free as I like to be. I, I feel like there's more freedom that needs to be in my life. Then perhaps it's time to take time and examine yourself. Are you spending the time that you need to studying God's word? Are you spending the time that you need to obeying God's word and applying it to your life? And Jesus presents a solution. Uh, Jesus, Jesus presents a solution that, that we should hold to God's word. And then he, in verse 35, he gives us a portrait of what this freedom looks like. He says, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but the son belongs there forever. So the son, he belongs, he's at home, right? He belongs there. He can stay as long as he like. He has all the freedom. He has all the ability to do whatever he wants. But the slave, the slave has no rights. They have no permanent place. And at some point, they're likely gonna get asked to leave or, or sold off to another owner. And so if you are a slave to sin, then the son's freedoms are not your freedoms. But Jesus continues the thought in verse 36 when he says that the, who the Son sets free is free indeed. And the Son is, is, is Jesus. And so, the, 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 and Jesus is the one who enjoys the freedom of the house. He is the one that, that um, he's the one who, is, who wants to give us freedom. And the freedom that he enjoys is a freedom that we too can enjoy. So that it's like the freest person in all the universe is wanting to pump free, uh, more freedom into our lives. He's wanting to make us free indeed. Freedom, uh, freedom to rise above our sins. Free to, to live holy lives. Free to be freer than we've ever been before. Freer to choose right from wrong. Free to, to, to choose the best. Free to, to keep growing in him free to reach our potential. And that is what it means to be free indeed. And it comes, according to the text, by, by holding to God's teaching, holding to Jesus' teachings, living into his teachings, and not just learning it, not just knowing it, but also obeying it. So about 243 years ago from tomorrow, on July 4th, 1776, a group of brave men ratified a document that we know as the Declaration of Independence. And they later signed it. And they pressed on with a revolution. I won't take time to read the whole document to you tonight and for the sake of time, but, but I'll read you the last line of it because it's, it's fairly profound. It says, 
And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of a divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And they paid a high price for that pledge. Five of them were captured and tortured by the British before they died. Twelve of them had their houses ransacked and burned to the ground. Two of them lost sons in the wars. One of them had a, two sons that were captured. Nine of them fought and later died from wounds or other hardships from the war. One of them, uh, Carter Braxton of Virginia, and he's a wealthy plantation owner, and he watched his, swips, his, his ships get swept out to sea by the British. He sold his house and died in rags. Thomas McKean was was so hounded by the British that he had to constantly move his family. And he served in Congress without pay, and he died a poor man. Thomas Nelson, his, his house was, was seized by, by the British in the battle for Yorktown. They were using it as a command post. And he went up to George Washington, and he urged them to open fire on his own house. His house was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. Freedom has always had a high price. And our freedoms as Americans were purchased at a very high price. And our, uh, uh, at a, a price that was costly and bloody. And yet it pales in comparison to, to the cost of our spiritual freedom. The cost of our spiritual freedom was paid by, by the death uh, of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection because it was there that he gave himself as a ransom for all the people. It was there that he became an atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only our sins, but for, but for all the sins of the whole world. It was there that, that he was pierced for our transgressions, that he was crushed for our iniquities, that, and, he was, and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And he was wounded, and by his wounds we are healed. It was there that the Lord laid, him, laid on him all the iniquities of all of us. And why would he do such a thing? The answer is quite simple. Because he loved us. And Romans 5 and 8 says, because he demonstrated his, his own, but God demonstrated his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. And so every day we must decide, do we want to live in bondage, or do we want to live in freedom? And perhaps there are some that, that um, have not begun that, that journey tonight. Some that have not begun to, to that journey to, to leave their, their sinful lives behind. But if, if you want to do that, it's quite simple. The first step, it takes three simple steps. The first step is to acknowledge that you're in bondage, to admit that you're a sinner, and then it's about believing that Jesus has the, power to, to, uh, has the power to deliver you from your bondage. And lastly, it's about confessing that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Others may find themselves that they, they were once free, but have now somehow, whether they've been lulled to sleep or didn't notice the temperature of the water was rising, they found themselves back in bondage again. perhaps gradually being desensitized, perhaps like Samson, God's power had left you and you don't even know when it happened. But Samson, in his last moments of his life, despite all of his failures, returned to God in faith. And in that last moment of faith and freedom, he did more to liberate the nation of Israel than he had done in his whole life. And that faith is available to you tonight to, to, to return to, to the freedom that you once had. And so tonight, I'd like to, to end, in, as we do many of our Wednesday nights, in a time of prayer. If, if you, if you fi find yourself of never beginning that relationship with the Lord, now is a great time to do it. If, if you've begun that relationship but have somehow fallen away, tonight's a great time to, to come back to that fresh relationship with the Lord. And others of us, maybe we look at our lives. We say, you know, we're a Christian, but as you look at your life, you say, well, I'm, I'm not as free as, as I wanna be. I wanna have more freedom in my life. And perhaps we need to spend some time in prayer and examining ourselves and saying, are we taking the time to truly learn the word of God 
And if we're learning the word of God, are we truly taking the time to apply it to our lives and obey it? Because Jesus says that that will bring freedom. And also tonight, spend a little time praying for, for our nation. It's a great time to, to thank God for all the freedoms that we have in, in this nation. It's a great time to pray for our nation, that, we'll, that, that he will lead us in the right direction, to pray for our leaders, that, that, they will, that they will lead us in the direction that he wants them to go, wants us to go. So there won't be a formal dismissal tonight, but won't you spend some time in prayer and the Lord releases you, you're free to go.